and it made me pretty bitter because the whole process was very misleading, um, very dishonest, and very stressful for all the students involved. As a small, religious, liberal arts college on the North Shore of Massachusetts, you would think things are relatively tame. Unfortunately, schoolwork and finals aren't the only things that these students have to worry about. From budget cuts affecting students, majors, and career choices, to hate crimes, the Gordon College students have been through a lot of stress. This is their story. College and I am an English major with a minor in secondary education and theater arts. My name is Elizabeth Rhodes and I'm a senior social work major at Gordon College. My name is Victoria Squire. I am a social work major and I'm currently a senior. I'll be graduating in the spring. Uh, my name is Nate Hillier. I went to Gordon College for three years. Uh, I was a part of the 3-2 physics and engineering program so I spent three years at Gordon studying physics, and now I'm on my first of my two years studying engineering at uh, Wentworth Institute of Technology. My name is Matthew Yoder. I went to Gordon for the past three years. I was part of a 3-2 physics slash engineering program there, um, and that was my experience at Gordon. At the end of my freshman year was when the budget cuts happened. These students were all affected by the budget cuts in some aspect. In 2019, it was announced that several academic programs were either going to be downsized or cut altogether. The majors affected were physics, social work, sociology, political science, philosophy, history, education, recreation, sports and wellness, French, and Spanish. In the process, 36 jobs in total were also eliminated. What I know about what happened back then, um, it wasn't exactly that the theater arts department was going to get cut, it was that one of our professors was going to lose their job. I first heard rumors about budget cuts um, towards the end of my freshman year. Um, we didn't really have any details about how it would be personally impacting my major until the beginning of sophomore year. We had a meeting at the beginning of my sophomore year that went over basically the requirements um, that would be changing to be able to graduate with their majors. Nate and Matt have since transferred to Wentworth in Boston as part of the 3-2 physics program they were enrolled in. When I first heard about the budget cuts, I honestly didn't think it would affect me that much because I heard about it from uh, one of the students in my, one of my peers in my program with me. Uh, one day we were in the cafeteria and she was like, they, they cut the physics program. And she was kind of panicking a lot. And I, I tried to be optimistic and think, all right, well, we're going to be grandfathered in to the program because, you know, the school promised us uh, a program and obviously they're going to follow through. My phone just started blowing up with text messages from friends, everyone in the physics department. And we were all discussing what happened. I, I, it took me a while to figure out what had even happened. And after a while, I realized they released the budget cuts and physics was one of the departments being cut. So naturally, everyone was freaking out and trying to figure out what was going to happen, who was going to teach our classes. And it was really a weird moment for me. They did follow through with the program, but significantly different than what I expected it to be. We talked with the Gordon physics professor to hear how the budget cuts impacted his department. My name is uh, Oleksiy Svetelsky. I am professor of physics here. I spent in Gordon, uh, uh, I am in Gordon from uh, 2014. Who I remember, I got email from provost that I'm invited to provost office for meeting for the, the next day. 
I was surprised, but I did not know what is that meeting about. And I came, and at the time was uh, Janelle was provost, and she told me that business program is going to be shut down. Actually, Gordon offered me a ter uh, terminal package, and at first Gordon was offering me just to stay for one semester and leave, but then they decided that uh, they need me for a longer time. We talked with Dr. Cook, a professor of psychology at Gordon College, who took on some extra responsibilities during the budget cuts. I'm Dr. Kay Cook, and I'm chair of the psych department and administrative chair of psychology, sociology, social work, and social welfare. Um, but I was asked to set up an appointment with the academic vice president, and she informed me and asked if I would be willing to chair several departments. But it gave me um, some significant administrative work to do, which was to um, identify who were the current sociology majors and social work majors um, and make sure that they had the courses they needed to graduate. Also to start thinking about majors and minors, we would have to end the social work major. It's very expensive. It's the guild makes the requirements that we simply couldn't meet. So um, I had to th um, think with Professor Coleman about an alternative major. One of the ways the budget cuts affected these students was in the quality of classes they were required to take for their major. When professors were let go, others had to take over the classes they used to teach. Other classes were simply substituted for different classes. There's definitely a world of difference in the uh, availability of classes and the quality of classes uh, after the budget cuts and versus before. So before, I I would like to vouch for Gordon College before the budget cuts. Like it was incredibly difficult, and I was learning a lot, and I was learning to be independent, and I was learning about a lot about math and physics, and I really felt intellectually stimulated. But after the budget cuts, it felt like it it, it felt completely different, for lack of a better word. Um, the quality of education felt very thrown together last minute. Um, there were adjunct professors that it felt like, it just felt like it wasn't as quality, nearly as quality as it could have been. It was really unfortunate. We had promised that everyone who was currently a major would get to finish their major. And as far as I'm aware of, we've kept that promise. They did, however, um, have access to all the courses that were needed for them to graduate. Sometimes even those courses were a compromise because it meant that they were taking psych statistics instead of social statistics. And of course, there was um, plans in place to combine psych statistics and social statistics before but it feels different when it's imposed on you and not, um, um, not a choice of professors within your major. For a lot of sociology students, that meant um, there would no longer be certain courses offered in sociology and they'd be placing them in political science classes. Um, and for um, the social work majors, that means a lot of the classes we were taking were either gonna be taught by different professors because they cut um, they cut a lot of professors, or it meant that um, we would be taking some psych classes in place of the social work ones previously offered. So they're calling them the same thing, but they're offering different courses um, than the ones that would have been offered prior because they were trying to phase out the major altogether. Um, so there was not the same uh, priority of getting us through with a quality education. It was just kind of checking off a box of saying, we promise that you're gonna get through it, so we're gonna make sure that you get through it, but it's not gonna look the same as someone else who was doing a major that wasn't impacted by budget cuts. What used to be two separate classes for social work majors, they've now made into one class. Um, and they only have one semester to talk about two subjects instead of two individual semesters for each one. So I think it does inhibit the learning. Um, a little bit, which is sad. 
one of my social research methods classes was, uh, the second version was like pretty much scraped together um, and put on for one semester just to get our grades through. And the people involved who made it happen did a really good job with what they were able to do, but they were given such poor circumstances to operate under. So a class that had been really solid for so many years going through Gordon was kind of um, put together super last minute just to get us through the class. But what ended up happening was they started waiving classes. So for example, I had to take thermal physics uh, for my for the three years portion at Gordon College, but they just waived that class. And I think there was another class too, I don't exactly remember the name of it, but I think they waived two of the classes, which is, it doesn't make sense to me because it's not gonna prepare me for, it's not gonna prepare me for future jobs as good as it could have been, you know? After the budget cuts, I there's less available classes in my major that I could take and some classes were being uh, just kind of crossed off of the requirements for what we needed, what previous students needed um, to graduate. And then they started getting rid of professors, which obviously that makes sense in terms of budget cuts, but I didn't understand why they didn't just keep the professors to finish our class and let us finish the classes we needed to take. Uh, as part of the program, we were planning to transfer at the end of our junior year. That's how it's always been in the program. Um, and with the, because of the budget cuts, a lot of our professors and advisors who had previously facilitated that process, they were left or put on sabbatical. And because of that, it made the process very difficult. We were fully staffed at the time. It's a, uh, it, uh caused me to teach more classes only uh, only now only only now it came because we lost at first we lost taut uh, wang um very talented and very nice uh, person and very good professor very good physicist we lost him the first he's now in harvard and uh, later later we lost uh, david lee uh, and and now, of course, I'm carrying a lot of. Oh <laughs> 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 Not the base. Yeah. If anyone uh, dares to laugh at me, he will fail the class. The process of slowly removing professors from our department took place over a longer period of time. So, the more time went on, the more dramatic the effects were. There's a very big difference because. Professors who previously hadn't taught certain classes were now teaching those classes because so many, there are so few professors that had to teach so many classes because professors were still being removed. We only had three, so um, that set like a huge panic in our um, class, in our whole department. We were like, we can't lose this one. Like, what are we gonna do if we only have two? And then at the end of that year, one of the other professors that we had um, made an announcement that they were going to leave and we were like, wait, hold on, what? Like, we're only going to have one? Um, so that was the biggest scare for us was um, that one, our professor is in danger of being uh, let go. And then on top of that, we were wondering if that might stem into them just dissolving the the major and minor in general and just leaving it as a program. The sociology majors lost a lot. Um, they lost faculty whom they were beloved. Um, and um, they also lost, I think, a sense that they mattered in the larger context. Um, we talked about creating an alternative major for them, but we're not able to do so. Uh, we talked about several minors, but we're slow to get those minors up and running. Um, I think it really made a difference that uh, for the uh, social work people, they felt continuity and the sociology people just felt abandoned. <clears throat> and I, it's, I just, I wish there was something that could have been done. And my yeah. own uh, sadness around losing the sociology major is huge. Historically, the sociology major was core to Gordon's contributions across the country. 
because of outstanding people who think about the place of religion in the larger culture. Not to have a sociology major is a huge loss. After all of those budget cuts, we only had one social, one full-time social work professor and one full-time sociology professor. We lost a lot of really valuable and knowledgeable voices of social work practice and sociology practice. Um, and I think we had a lot to learn from those people and the way that they were terminated, I think is unfair and the way that incoming freshmen of that year, so my sophomore year, the freshmen, you know, below us, the way that they were not told early on um, that those professors were being cut and that the major was being cut is unfair. Um, I think overall it was handled very poorly. And we got taken over by the psychology department, um, which we're very thankful that we got taken under their wing. However, psychology and social work are very different and there's been problems. Um, like we no longer have our own like department head. Like we have someone who makes the decisions for our department who's not even a part of our department, which is frustrating. However, not all professors lost their jobs, as we soon found out. No, actually, and I think it's because a lot of alumni caught word that that might happen and they just reached out on like, to like, just like the public community, like people at Boston University who had done like their summer theater intensive who had, and had worked with their professor got everyone to be like, this is happening, this is really bad, like this professor is really good at their job, like they can't lose it. I really think that was probably a really big part of why that professor didn't lose their job. Social workers in particular were affected by the budget cuts. With the cuts, they weren't sure if Gordon College would still be accredited. I came into Gordon knowing that the social work program had this special accreditation and that I could graduate and go right into grad school. And I was very excited about that. And that thought existed for only like one, one and a half semesters. Social work to be accredited by the Council of Social Work Education, which um, is the board that accredits all different schools. Um, you have to follow the guidelines and the like parameters to be accredited as an institution. And so when they changed what courses that they were offering, and when they changed the rules and regulations about practicum for social work students, um, that means that they lost their accreditation because they were no, follow, no longer following um, the rules and regulations that they needed and they weren't offering the same courses to be able to be accredited. So they changed the name to social welfare, which basically means they lost their accreditation. Social welfare is the new major that was created after the decisions of the priorities committee. Even though it's a compromise and not a perfect compromise, not even at times a good compromise, we can still help those students to get the background, the training that they need. Um, and so in social, the transition from social work to social welfare has been relatively seamless in that courses are in place, people are in place to teach them. So the social work major, the largest difference is that with the social work majors, they were under, our program was under a special accreditation that we did have to pay money for, which is another reason why they most likely cut it, because um, it costs money to maintain. But as a social work major, for my internship, I have to complete 400 credit hours of, um, and it, of practicum internship. So that's about 32 hours a week for one semester. Um, with COVID, they'd cut that number down to 340. The social welfare majors only have to complete 110 hours, I believe. I believe it's 110. Um, so that's only 10 hours a week. So they're not getting as much practice, like in the field experience as a social work major is. A lot of what they're learning is kind of the more generalized version of what so the social work majors were learning. Um, I don't know if they will be dive there. They don't have the chance to dive in as much into practice and theory as much as we do. 
The students often wonder why the budget cuts happened. Was it purely for monetary reasons? Not enough students in the program? Or was it some other reason? I don't know the full reasons. I was never made aware of that, but I imagine it had to do with the uh, popularity and the size of our major in our department. The physics program and the engineering program at Gordon was very rigorous, it was very difficult, um, and that caused a lot of people to drop out of it um, even before the budget cuts happened. So the graduating classes for physics, it would only be like five to 10 people normally. So because that was so small, my guess is that was the reason behind them cutting it. Although it was growing, our my freshman year, it was the largest freshman class being introduced into physics engineering at Gordon yet, and that was the year they cut it. I see no reason to for the physics department to be closed. We were a pretty successful department. I decided I just did not see how this could happen because we had a lot of students whom somebody is supposed to teach. So if I just sign the package and accept it, uh, then uh, program would indeed close, but not just program close. It would cause um, big damage to Gordon reputation because we just got a lot of students, uh, freshman students that year, who declared physics in major. We got 17 students declaring physics in major. And if I just signed up that package, uh, I, well, for me, it was not possible just to sign the package. Yes. Will you touch one of it? <laughs> I think it, I think physics is just an expensive program to to sustain physics and engineering. There's a lot of equipment, a lot of labs to uh, I don't know to fund. There's probably research grants that go into it, but I don't fully know. But that's what I suspect. Totally financial. Uh, departments had to do a financial assessment. Um, every department. And the Guild of Social Work requires um, that uh, certain positions be offered, and we don't have enough students to cover those courses. The main reason that I was told Gordon was cutting the social work um, accreditation was because it was expensive and it was costly and it was just too much money for them. They needed to be able to um, get themselves back on their feet financially. Um, but I think if that really were the case, they would not have been bringing in new majors as they were phasing out older ones. Um, if it was really an issue of finances, um, I think they would be cutting programs and then kind of reevaluating, not cutting programs and then immediately bringing new ones in. Um, that was really frustrating for me because it felt like a very dishonest answer. Logically, numbers wise, I think we weren't getting as many students in the social work program. So that's why they decided to cut us because we weren't getting as many people. But I don't think it was a wise decision at all. However, it's interesting because within the last couple of years, we've gotten a lot of social welfare majors, um, specifically people who are interested in becoming social workers in the future. Um, and that program has now become pretty large um, and a lot of kids take that introductory class and decide, oh, I actually want to go into social work. What I really think is um, Gordon is a, it's a Christian institution and that's obviously very clear to everybody here. Um, and to be accredited for the Council on Social Work Education, they have, you know, a list of expectations and rules that colleges have to go by to gain accreditation. And a huge, huge, huge part of that is um, anti-discrimination against LGBTQ communities, against people of color. Um, and I think that's a huge point of tension for Gordon because obviously we're extremely discriminatory against the LGBTQ community, especially. Um, and that's something that the Council of Social Work Education um, came out with. They came out with a statement, I believe it was last year, um, about reiterating the importance of equity and teaching students that um, 
none of those populations can be discriminated against at any of the schools. And there were actually, um, there was a, another university who announced their um, cutting the accreditation of their program, um, cutting social work as a whole because of the um, statements of anti-discrimination against um, queer communities. And I think that is something that's awkward for Gordon to like speak on because it's a very um, controversial point, but they're very clear that they don't support. The Council for Social Work Education is very forward with pursuing social justice um, and social justice for that community, specifically the LGBTQ plus community, is that something that Gordon has um, a sad history of conflicting with that community. So honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that's a hidden reason, but I'd like to think that it's not. Gordon College has a history of discriminating against members of the LGBTQ plus community. In the student handbook, it says that, quote, homosexual practice is, quote, expressly forbidden, and that members of the Gordon College community must follow this expectation. In 2014, former President D. Michael Lindsay signed a letter that was sent to the White House asking for a religious exemption to discriminate when it came to hiring on the basis of sexual orientation. Currently, there is an ongoing lawsuit between a former social work professor and Gordon College, with the professor claiming that she was not promoted due to her opposition of the school's policies on the LGBT community. jobs weren't the only thing impacted by the budget cuts. Students say that their mental health was also affected. We found it very difficult, it was very stressful, we didn't feel like we had a lot of guidance, and that was a direct result of the budget cuts. I questioned whether my, you know, academic achievement or just my, my classes would be rigorous enough because they would be cutting so many professors and it made me think about if I really wanted to go into social work. The budget cuts impacted me personally um, in what I chose to major in and um, what I chose to not major in. I was considering social work and sociology as a double major, um, but it was going to be more complicated to be able to finish um, both of those in the amount of time that I wanted to finish in, um, even though they promised um, all the kids in our grade that we'd be able to finish on time. It made me nervous that it was going to impact my career options, that Gordon had a really bad reputation because of that, and that would make employers less interested in hiring me because of where I got my undergrad degree. Um, made me nervous about uh, grad school applications and being accepted by those if they saw that Gordon was on my transcript for my undergrad. Um, and it made me pretty bitter because the whole process was very misleading, um, very dishonest, and very stressful for all the students involved. Um, but our program directors did everything they could to be able to get us through um, with all the promises that were made when we came in. So that I'm very grateful for. It really did upset me and it really did, um, it made me lose faith a little bit in the administration, the Gordon College administration, because there were many points where we didn't know what was happening. Like the program wasn't there and then it was back, but it's it's under a different name. I just didn't really understand what was going on and that mentally was upsetting. I personally responded by anger with my fellow social work classmates for sure. Talking with other people in the program, seeing what they were doing, how they were responding to it talking with my advisor who was actually leaving because she was fired and getting to know my new advisor um, but I was I was angry um, and frustrated and confused um, I would say as a whole our morale was pretty low because we were kind of just 
to put it plainly, like pissed off that the school was not taking our education seriously when we're paying the same tuition as everybody else, having the same expectations that we're gonna be getting a high quality education the way everyone else is, um, the way people are who didn't have their majors cut. And it wasn't just social work, it was lots of other programs too. Um, but I would say all of us kind of bonded over it because we were frustrated and we were you know, concerned about how it would impact our future and our career and our ability to get into grad school. It was definitely a very difficult time for myself and a lot of my friends, but I also know that this event, although it was difficult on our uh, college career, it made us stronger people. It was, I felt that myself and a lot of my friends matured a lot during that time because we were going through these trials that were unprecedented and we weren't expecting and that that definitely made me a stronger person. So although it was difficult and I wasn't happy about the budget cuts, I think it did have a, um, a good benefit on my life. There were some good things that came out of it. With all of this in mind, students wondered if they should transfer. I think we all considered transferring. Um, so yeah, I did. But since the nature of my program is to transfer after three years, I had already finished my first year and I thought, all right, I'm just going to stick it out for the next two years. It's going to be fine. So I did consider, but I stuck it out. I did consider transferring. I, I think for me personally, I had created so many strong relationships with the people at Gordon, um, friends and professors, and that part would have been really difficult for me to start over. Um, but academically, I think it, looking back, would have been a smart move um, because the education wouldn't be like half-assed the way that it is at Gordon <laughs> for, you know, at a different school. Um, I also think the process of transferring is, it's just not easy. And so it was something I considered, but I didn't follow through with. Um, but I really commend everyone who did because there were a decent amount of people who transferred from budget cuts. At first, I didn't consider transferring, um, but as time went on and this, as the semesters went on, I definitely did start to consider that more. I probably would have transferred early if there was an efficient, uh, communication between us and the administration at Gordon because certain classes we didn't realize that had been offered in previous years, we didn't realize that they weren't going to be offered until it was too late to transfer. Not only did I consider changing my major, but I considered transferring schools. I thought about going to a school in Boston or going to a school in Connecticut where one of my friends from home goes to school. The reason why I didn't was, I don't really know if I'm being honest, part of me wonders why. Um, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed the social environment of Gordon. I enjoyed the professors that I did have here at Gordon. And I think it was a very unique experience. Um, and I knew I wanted to live on the North Shore and remain in the North Shore. And I talked to my current advisor about it, um, Sybil Coleman, she's absolutely amazing, about if she thought that the program is still worth staying in here at Gordon my freshman year. And she said, yes, she said, it's not going to be what it was before, but you should still stay. And as she said, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'm not talking as your professor. I'm talking as someone advising you. Um, so that meant a lot to hear from her, and I trusted her, and I'm glad I did. Knowing what they know now, we asked students if they could do it all over again. Would they choose Gordon College, or perhaps would they have gone a different route? So I think I still would have went to Gordon. Um, like I said before, the first year and a half was great. It was the most intellectually stimulated I've ever been, and it was phenomenal. 
uh, I felt like I was really getting my money's worth from tuition and housing and everything. But yeah, so I guess to answer your question, I, I still would have stayed at Gordon, I think. I, I still would have gone to Gordon, but I think I would have been a lot more hesitant to go. I think that's really difficult for me to say when considering the friendships I've made um, and the few professors left who have had a really positive impact on me. Um, but Gordon as a whole really does not value their students' needs um, and the education that they said they would provide that they're clearly not providing at this point. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, yeah, it's difficult for me to say that because I have had um, a very fortunate experience getting to know some really great people and professors here. Um, but strictly academically, I absolutely wish I had chosen differently. Um, I think it would have set me up for success in a much better way. I think so. Part of me says no because of the connotation that Gordon has for being against the LGBTQ plus community. And I hope that's something I don't encounter in the field when people hear that I'm from Gordon, um, that people of that community or people who support that community um, hide that from me. And especially as a future counselor, you know, that's, that's something we wanna avoid as social workers is people feeling like they can't trust us. Um, so that's something that I do fear. Um, I do feel like I have gotten a good education here. It's hard to say definitely one way or the other because I did have a lot of really good experiences at Gordon, even especially in my physics and engineering classes. Um, a lot of the really good experiences I had were before the budget cuts, but I still had a lot after. I had a lot of opportunities to do research and take some great classes even after the budget cuts. Um, so I can't say fully one way or the other, but if I had known this was going to happen, it definitely would have changed my decision-making process about where I was going to go to school. These students have a few things to say to the Gordon College administration. They should have told students sooner. If, and I say if they were able to, but I am assuming that they were able to because if they made the decision to make budget cuts on that short of notice, then they have a whole nother problem going for them. Um, Cause those things take time to decide and should take time to decide. So they should have let us as students know sooner, incoming students know sooner. Um, and especially with the way that they fired a lot of our professors, they should have handled that way better and also responding to student backlash of those firings there was a lot i understand the um the situation behind having to make these budget cuts and obviously something had to go uh the money just didn't add up um i do think there were some things that could have been handled better uh particularly um the timing of this of them sharing this news it was i believe the week before our finals which added a lot of stress to an already stressed out group of students. Um, and I feel like that affected myself and a lot of other students' uh, performance on our final exams because we were suddenly wondering if these exams were then in vain. Um, so that timing was difficult. Obviously I'm unhappy with the choice to cut the physics department, but I understand that they did it. Um, and obviously something had to go. Uh, I don't think it was a good choice, but I'd say the main thing that could have been handled better was the timing of the announcement of the budget cuts. Part of me is honestly relieved that a school who does not promote the holistic acceptance of a person as they come in a committed and loving way, that if they can't provide that, um, then they shouldn't be promoting an education for people who aren't gonna follow through with that in a career that's designed to help any and every type of person, no matter what population you come from, no matter your race, your gender identity, your sexual orientation, your religion, your socioeconomic status. Um, so I think it's really unfortunate that Gordon has chosen the position that they have chosen. 
Um, but I think if that's what they're gonna go with, then they're doing the rest of the world a favor by not graduating people who disagree with the wholehearted acceptance of people as they come when you're working in a profession where that's absolutely necessary and you can't be biased. I think the Gordon administration, I think they should have been a little bit more open with, with the students because they knew what they were talking about. They knew everything that was happening, but I felt like I was just in the dark. Like I heard that the program was cut, then it came back and then I didn't fully understand the changes. There was a point where the administration uh, uh, outputted some sort of website that described the budget cuts, but I read it and I was honestly a little confused. I, I didn't know if it was completely accurate and if it would hold up. Um, I know the administration in the end, they have to do what's gonna work out best for them financially. I get that. But I wish I had been communicated to better and more efficiently. I have a lot of qualms with cutting this specific program because there is such a need for not only social workers in general in the world right now, but faith-based social workers who know deep within them and like hold on to their faith the fact that all human beings are made in the image of God uh, and therefore we're called to treat them with dignity and respect and that that value I think is yeah that value plays into all of our ethics as social workers of how we treat people um, and I think it's such an important program to have um, to just train caring people to learn how to be caring for a profession and like advocate for other people. I would just hope that you're content with the decisions that you made knowing, um, probably not knowing because you probably haven't had personal experiences with students making the decisions that you've made, um, but that you're content with the decisions you've made and how that has really impacted the student body and set us back um, and still can call yourself a Christian institution, a liberal arts institution, and hold the same kind of um, respect for all of the rest of your programs when you've cut so many vital ones um, to being a well-rounded institution. As well as the budget cuts also came a different kind of pain among the student body. All students want at Gordon College is a sense of security when they commit to it, to receive their education and seek their degree with a Christian focus. In no world should there be a fear of living at Gordon College. Unfortunately, for these students, that hasn't been the case. Here are their stories. Sophia. I'm a senior. I'm a con major. Uh, yeah. My name is Eli. I am a currently a junior and my major is political science with a minor in black studies. Well, I was an RA in Fulton at the time. I was, it was my junior year. It was my first year serving on Res Life staff. Um, awesome. <laughs> um, and I was just going around doing my first rounds chatting and I got a call from a resident um, who was a senior um, that last year so he's graduated by now and he asked me to come because somebody had written um, something bad in the laundry room and you know I wasn't really thinking about what kind of bad thing somebody would talk about but I do remember very specifically that that resident was very distraught like almost like it sounded like um he was like sick from what he saw so i was not preparing to see something good so then i went in there and i saw the t-shirt just very like laid out on top of a wash on top of the counter actually where people do their laundry and then i just immediately called alex or rd yeah we had an emergency meeting that night um at like 10 30 in our basement lounge and all of our staff just kind of talked about what had happened. Um, we prefaced it with what had occurred and we went around and people who wanted to see what had happened were able to see it on my phone. And I immediately 
we all like prayed that was like gut reaction was a really long time of prayer which is really actually super nice because it helped all of us ready like become ready to handle that situation it was really like i think you could like really sense like the emotional reaction was definitely there at first and then after we prayed we felt more prepared to talk about it figure out what we were going to do next how to get our student leaders involved and um, and really how to take care of like our residence hall members and other students in our community after that. It was a lot of group just planning, talking. We had, <laughs> we all met in the student life. Um, you know that, what's the place, is that the GCSA office downstairs by Gillies? We all met there like the next day and just spent like three hours like praying, talking, planning out what what is supposed to happen next. And then obviously later on that week, um, the Frost sit-in happened and um, we took that time while we were in Frost to come up with petitions for Res Life as well and figuring out how to set something in motion so that we could handle these kinds of events better. God forbid they ever happen again, but it was a really big chain reaction of things for our staff. So I saw the incident on Instagram from an alumni who graduated from Gordon, I think two years ago. Um, and then I like screenshotted it and texted it and I was like, this is fake, there's no way. Like, um, and then people were confirming and then I saw it like all over Instagram. Um, my friends were texting me about it. So yeah, it was, it was like, it was there and then all of a sudden it was like a blow up of screenshots everywhere. First time I heard what happened, um, I checked Instagram and then I texted a friend who was on the Abraham Way um, Club Committee. And once I heard the wind of what happened, I was honestly devastated, but at the same time, not really surprised. Um, it was kind of a little bit of tension with the political um, election last, last year, and so a lot of people were kind of on edge about that, which was understandable, but I think a lot of people weren't on both sides of the spectrum a lot of people weren't understanding of each other and so i think that's how the shirt came to be so it was hard because it negatively affected more of the black community but um having a lot of friends within that community it was definitely hard to see them struggle with it and like me being a latina it's I go through like similar but very different also me being of a different skin complexion like I can empathize in a lot of ways um, but it was like kind of the balance of trying to figure out how to support them and also how to like take care of myself while like reliving other things that I went through in high school um, so I think it brought up a lot of emotions for a lot of different people like for me it just brought up like past emotions from like high school experiences for a lot of the black community, it was like this was something that had been happening to them on campus since they got there. Um, so I think like trying to figure out how to support them well and like listen to them and make sure that they were being heard and not like talked over um, and not spoken for, but literally just listened to was something that I think was helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they definitely did. Um, it kind of shaped as to why I don't feel comfortable in certain areas of Gordon and. Um, being on the track team, you have to run a certain amount, a certain amount of miles to kind of stay in shape. And um, honestly, I don't really run around here. I bike everywhere, so I think like that's my middle ground of getting my workouts and still feeling comfortable and stuff. And I think it's kind of sad that I have to say I'm not really comfortable in some areas of Gordon, and it should be that I'm safe around everywhere. But I'm not the only one who feels unsafe, so. I was really angry. I try not to demonstrate my anger ever, but I was just really mad. And then um, immediately after that, it was just a lot of go mode, go do something else kind of reaction. Um, it, it's definitely like something that takes a toll on you emotionally. Um, but I felt like I didn't have a reason to really react so emotionally when it wasn't um specifically like you know like what was written on that shirt wasn't specifically targeted at my um ethnicity so I and also we were dealing with so many other 
different tensions that semester that I was just not ready to like emotionally like t address all of that so it was a lot of just like okay I'm gonna just do something else how can I get involved with what my peers are doing to help address this issue how can I support other people right now how can I I like really like to deflect <laughs> emotionally so I was just kind of everywhere else I think I don't even remember <laughs> but yeah oh my gosh yeah like who wasn't like I it just brought up so many different emotions it's not just like this one incident that happened like that one incident brings up memories of a thousand other little incidents that just build up and it's just like a constant reminder of like what they've had to deal with their entire lives what I've had to deal with my entire life I'm um, coming from a different background than a lot of people um, it's also just confusing because it's like why like our cultures are and our backgrounds are so important and to us and like we see them as a blessing and it's just kind of like why does that affect other people so negatively so it's like reconciling that um, also just like again trying to find the balance of taking care of my my own mental health while still being able to be there for other people and listen and validate their experiences um, knowing that a lot of people within the black community specifically felt unsafe um, especially to be in David Bayo's hall um, or even to be in Fulton where the t-shirt incident happened so also like kind of trying to create a home for people um, and create spaces where people were feeling safe and comfortable and heard um, so it's like a balance of all of that also taking care of myself definitely frustrations definitely frustrations um, do I think it damages Gordon's view a little bit um, it makes Gordon susceptible and complicit in allowing this to happen. All right, I'm gonna give you an example because mm -hmm. I've talked about this multiple times. If you live in Evans, first floor, right? And someone does laundry on a Tuesday afternoon and, and someone does their laundry, the next thing you hear is the fire alarm. We, have, we all have to evacuate, we all have to get outside, and then we come to find out that someone left their, they overfilled, they overfilled the um, washing machine. And you know, when the, when the washing machine gets overfilled, a lot of water seeps out of the pipes, it starts to smoke, and like, you know, cause a, cause a fire alarm to ring, right? Now, GoPo and the RA and the RD who lives in Evans will be like, okay, who did this? And then they'll question all of the first floor boys. Oh, is this yours? Is this yours? If they come to no conclusion that no, whoever, the owner of the clothes doesn't want to come up, they find the entire floor. They find the, it happened to me my freshman year. It wasn't my clothes and I knew it wasn't my clothes, but I still got fined for someone else not stepping up. So if this situation happened, and since it did happen in Fulton, I thought it was clear that they would ask everyone, oh, okay, did you do this? Do you know who did this? If there were, if every boy at, had said no, then find the whole floor. Cause then that sets a precedent that says, okay, you don't want to tell us, fine, but $300 is going to hurt your pocket. And then once everyone sees $300 hurts their pockets, they're like, okay, maybe, you know what, I know who did it. Or, yeah, I know someone who said something about it. You get information instead of just like, oh, you know, doing like, like not saying they weren't doing anything. I'm just saying what they're doing, it didn't like show change because other people still see the same thing that they're doing and it's not really benefiting. Like the cameras that they talked about, they put in place, they didn't do nothing at this time, you know? And it, it bothers me because it's like, you're going to play this, you're going to tiptoe this line of, of privacy and security, but then when you implement certain security measures in place, they don't look like they're being secured or they don't look like they're protecting us in a way, you know? And that, that's the whole point of saying we're going to have these security measures in place is to protect us, you know? And so I think that, if you're looking from that view, it kind of, damage Gordon in terms of what they say to their students and how their students take what they say back. I mean, mentally, I can't even imagine what a lot of my 
friends who are people of color felt like during that time. Um, but even just like sitting with them, listening to them talk about how they were hurting. Um, it was just really hard and like my whole social work department, especially, um, you know, we, I think it was during our departmental prayer or maybe we got together outside for, of our time together for a prayer. Um, and we just prayed and prayed and prayed for the Gordon community after that event. Um, my mental health, it was really hard because the whole campus just like fell on edge for that entire semester. Um, so always constantly feeling on edge mentally was draining. I think that Dan Timon sending out an email like right away after figuring out what happened um, really was like a good thing. I think that was something that needed to happen. Um, I know in the moment we would have also appreciated an immediate response from our president at the time and that didn't happen and that was really frustrating. I think administration wise it was really hard to figure out what was right and what was wrong. I've never really been super involved with um, GCSA or any type of like leadership that communicates with our administration. Um, but I don't know. I remember specifically at the Frost sit-in after a day had passed and Shanika and Cam came back and said that they had finally gotten a meeting, like figured out a meeting with um, the board and with the president. I, I, was really surprised at how it took that to get them to meet with Shanika and Cam. Um, so that was something that was a little frustrating for sure. Um, but like I said, like I don't really have any concept of how exactly we could have done better because I felt like it shouldn't have happened in the first place. One of the big things I remember um, somebody at the sit and talking about um, was how like people who decide to do those things shouldn't be at this school. And I guess that's a big part of administrative duty that failed us was getting to the place where that kind of thing could have happened. So if anything, it was something that could have been prevented at the very beginning that just wasn't there. At first it didn't damage my view of Gordon as a whole because when the incident happened I was like okay this is one person on this campus it doesn't like reflect on the faculty and the staff like they're gonna figure it out they're gonna do what they need to do um, and then when they started to attempt to do things it's it's hard I want to give grace to the campus and I want to give grace to the faculty and staff um, because this is a really difficult situation to handle, especially the majority of staff and faculty being white. I can understand that it's hard to navigate how to think about it, what to do, especially like if racism isn't something that like affects your life very much, I can understand how it's hard to like empathize or really understand where people are coming from. So I do want to like give the campus grace, but at the same time, um, it was difficult to do so because there's a lot of things that Gordon seems to care about like I was just talking to another student the other day who had like taken some food from Lane for her friend and they're like making her go on probation they're making her like do service hours they're making her like pay a fine and I was like you guys care so much about someone taking food but when it comes to like a crime like that it's a little less cared for and like there was an investigation that was happening but like after we heard that they were trying to get investigators involved it kind of went dead and nothing else was said about it and they almost I don't know what was going on behind the scenes um, but it felt from an outside perspective that they were just kind of like well there's nothing we can do so we're just not even gonna try um, there was like no follow-up on the individuals that were affected by it there was no like mental health check in like a lot of the things that were initiated on campus were initiated by students and not the faculty and staff at all um again i don't know like what happened behind the scenes i don't know whose job is what that they can facilitate those kind of things but i got frustrated because i've just seen gordon be so much more strict about so many other things that aren't necessarily i don't want to say not important but aren't as crucial or you know affecting other students as this was
so that was I think what was the frustrating thing it uh, <laughs> I don't think that I was shocked that it happened I don't think it damaged anything that I didn't already know um I definitely was really disappointed in like just knowing like oh like we're just gonna like somebody's gonna people feel bold enough to do this like out in the open like obviously like there was like some kind of secrecy to both of the hate crimes that happened all of the hate crimes <laughs> oh that's awful to say but you know there were other hate crimes addressing the um asian community as well and all those things were done in ways that people probably knew they weren't going to get caught but you know the fact that people have the audacity to just go out and do that was really disappointing it's not like you know like because there are racist people everywhere there are like hateful people everywhere but the fact that they felt able enough to like just go out and actually do what they did that was disappointing i don't think it damaged anything though specifically yeah, I knew about that one too, like when it first happened. I can't remember how I heard about it. I mean, David Bay was in our in the scholarship program I'm in, so I think I heard it was like going through the grapevine and that. Um, but yeah, I had heard about that before the teacher. I thought that more was going to be... One, I guess that's a really important thing to point out. I was really unhappy with the way that that incident was taken care of. And so were like a lot of people that I knew in Russ life. And... Because of that, we, the encouragement for us as a Res Life staff in Fulton to work even harder to make a difference and like change the way that things were going and like make it an example of like, listen, like this can't happen. Like we are not tolerating this. Um, it was only like um, highlighted because we knew how exactly that went down or didn't go down. Like we watched we watched a thirty minute video of people being like shalom and then nothing <laughs> happened and we were like okay well then it kind of makes it easy for someone to be like this is all that's gonna happen if i commit an actual hate crime it's not okay so yeah i i think that that one at the beginning was really intense and like we did so much and then only so much happened so we were like this can't keep going on like we have to actually figure out how we're going to get everyone involved in healing, in um, prevention, and in just like promoting like an overall atmosphere of safety on campus again, especially for students of color. So yeah, yeah. Yes, yes I did. Um, I also saw that on Instagram and um, that one kind of shocked me a little bit just because I know everything that was going on last semester with um, the election, a lot of people weren't really expecting to have that trans um, transform into Gordon also. Like Gordon was kind of like a lot of people's safe space. Like, okay, this is going on here. I don't have to worry about it at Gordon, you know? And I think that's what a lot of people had in mind um, until seeing that, um, that deface sign. And I know David wasn't really expecting it, but at the same time, like, it was almost inevitable if nothing was going to happen, but like it had happened, so he kind of handled it the right way, in my opinion. Um, so I was actually in quarantine when that happened. Um, so I was getting a lot of secondhand stories of that. Um, I had a friend, well, actually a lot of friends who were at that sit-in, so I was getting a lot of updates on what um, was being said throughout that whole, uh, the Frost sit-in. And this is all secondhand, so i i'm not sure like how to react to a lot of things that were said but from what i had heard from a lot of people um it just kind of seemed like nothing was getting done if that makes sense like it seemed like something that was a really good creative safe place for a lot of the black community and even just like other communities that aren't white um and it seemed like a time for people to come together and create unity with each other and recognize what was going on on campus but at the end of the day like students can only do so much and they can only say so much it's like actually like are they being heard are they being listened to who's actually following through with what they're saying and taking care of these students 
it just kind of felt throughout the year that it was just a bunch of students speaking out and nothing was being done with that. Um, which was just frustrating to listen to and watch. And on top of that, COVID was happening and that's even like a whole nother situation. So like nobody was doing well and that was obvious. And um, it sometimes felt like Gordon wasn't taking initiative to really like check in and take care of the students. Um, I wasn't there. I drove past it, drove, rode past it um, on my way to work. Uh, I knew that what they were doing was good and it needed to be said and it needed to be heard. I think the stories of the students was very touching and you can feel the anger through someone's story. And I think that's the whole message of that is to understand how someone else feels. And I think once you understand how someone else feels, you can put yourself in that shoe. You know, regardless of race, everyone's been discriminated before. Everyone's been hated against before. So I think if we, like have a conversation and sit down about certain things that's, that has happened, you can understand to some degree, oh, this person's felt like this before, I felt like that. And then the, you and the other person can connect uh, on, a, on, a build it, on, a, on a stronger level and create a bond that you know, most people don't really have. You know? And I think as a culture on campus, that would be good you know, if we had multiple conversations throughout the year of how we can come together instead of go apart. I think it would be better as a whole for the campus. I went to the sit-in um, the afternoon when it began. I was in the building of Frost. Um, I didn't stay overnight. It was very moving to be there. Um, very, it was just such a sad time. I felt like we all were like, we all were under this like weight and I remember seeing my friends, like my black and brown friends are just being like, oh my, like just holding them and hugging them. Like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Like, it just felt so heavy. And I think a huge frustrating thing was that the president at the time, our former president was not there because he had a business trip. Um, Luckily, you know, Dan Timon was there and God bless that man. He's absolutely amazing. Um, he had great words to say and a few other professors were there. Um, but I did not spend the night. Um, I know people who did. I know people from my department who did. Uh, but that time was just so... Like, I don't even know how to describe it, just so heavy and so, it was such a time of mourning overall. The sit-in that happened was good, but it was a good start. I felt like we needed to do more in terms of asking for common courtesy of the situation. Um, I know, like, it's actually funny. Um, Gordon, they post on their um, website every incident that happens, whether it's a sexual assault, a, a burglary incident, a bullying incident, um, a hate crime incident, they report every, um, they report every uh, incident online. And I saw that what we're talking about was on their call logs yes, last year. And um, it's funny because this year marks one year since it happened and there's no results on it in terms of who committed it, what's their consequence, where do we go forward? And um, I personally blame, I blame those who are in Fulton because we can't act like no one knows what happened and it just ended up there. Someone had to write on it, someone had to leave it in the room and then someone had to tell at least some of their friends. No one is gonna be like that secretive of, of oh, I just did this. Oh, I'm kind of famous on Instagram. No, um, I think we're very complicit and silent in allowing certain people to say and do things, you know, that isn't really considered normal, fair, just, or even just being nice on a whole and courteous as the last. So. 
I think it definitely messed with my mental health a little bit and, and made it put things in perspective for me because I have white friends on, across campus and I know their intention is to, you know, be nice to me and just have a good conversation or whether it's to go to the basketball court and play in competitive basketball for a couple of hours. Like, I know, I know the trueness of who they are, you know, and I didn't want these incidents can, to kind of um, destroy that. And like that's why this like kind of topic is like really close to me because I've grown up before with all people of life, you know, and like I've heard things that's been said to me, I've heard things that's been said against me, I've heard things that said like not in front of my face, and um, it's just really hard to like put people in the situation now because then you're gonna have to pick: are you on this side or on this side? And it's like, can I be in the middle because I'm still like going through this even today so um again i want to have grace because i don't know what was happening behind the scenes like i really i don't know like what people were doing day in and day out i can only talk from an outside perspective but from an outside perspective i don't think so like at least I, it just didn't feel like they were um like i know dml sent emails but like an email is only gonna do so much like i know he talked at a i can't remember if it was a convocation he talked somewhere and addressed the issue um but i know that a lot of people felt like that wasn't effective just because i don't know it sounded like he was like trying to talk his way around it and like not really take initiative to make sure that something was changing or that the students were going to be okay um, so like safe spaces are great and addressing the issue is great and it's it was cool to see that administration wasn't necessarily like blind to what was happening but it's also like you can't like you can't um, turn away from something that's like right in your face I sometimes wonder like had it been a situation that was more hidden like would they have addressed it or but like because it was right in their face of course they have to I think it just kind of felt sometimes like they were only doing so much to get us to say like okay you did a good job like you addressed it but you can only do that for so long like there does come a time where people are waiting for things to be done and waiting to you know have initiative being taken um so it felt sometimes like gordon was only doing just enough for them to get away with like addressing the issue Again, I don't know what was going on behind the scenes, so I do want to give like grace to that and you know understand that like I don't know everything that was going on in the background, so I don't know the work that people were putting in, but from the outside and how it was delivered, it felt like not much was being done. No, not at all. I mean, I just gave you a clear example of what they could have done. Who knows how many other examples they could have done, you know, to kind of rectify the situation. The fact that it happened, the fact that they still don't know after an entire year, that means we all been living, eating, going to class, going to work technically because we can work on campus, going to the gym with someone who has racist motives and feelings towards black people, you know, and that. It doesn't bother me. It bothers me to the person who doesn't know how to handle that. Handle that understanding, handle that clarity that they live with a racist person on campus. Some people don't know how to really go about it. And I want to be uh, a safe space for those who feel like they don't know what to do, like realizing that, okay, this person committed this crime they didn't have any consequence. They probably still live on campus. We don't know, cool. How do you feel about it? I'm, most people I've heard say they're angry, they're pissed off, they're frustrated, they want to punch something, but we can't get into violence on campus because that, that's just going to lead to a bigger issue. So how to minimize their anger and their frustrations down to understanding that people are people to a certain extent, and if certain things are in place and you still can't find the culprits of who committed a crime, you have to move past the issue in, in terms of how it makes you feel. Every time I hear about this subject, it used to get me upset, but I had to understand that he's not the, he or she is not the only person who thinks that way. And then if we, if we remove ourselves from the Gordon bubble, 
there's plenty of people who view that way. We can look online and just type in racist people. You're going to find a boatload of information of racist people. So um, I think as Christians, we should try to bring that person together. Not really. I know when Christianity is spoken about with this conversation, it's hard because you want to you want to be able to forgive someone. But at the same token, you need to understand that you yourself need to forgive before you can forgive the other person. And so with Christianity being involved with that, I think it's, it's good to understand and set boundaries for yourself in talking about situations like this. So you know where your, where your line is. And then if it's crossed, you can step back. If it's not, you can continue further. Yeah. It damaged to an extent. It didn't, I don't know how much it damaged my view of the student body because I knew that there were people out there who maybe felt that way. I didn't know that there were people bold enough to act on those feelings. Um, and it was a little shocking for this, what I'm assuming and what we're assuming as a student member um, to do that. But the way that Gordon handled it also could have been better, absolutely. Um, the case is still open on, I believe, both of the things that all, the multiple things that happened um if you go on the police records the case is still open i don't think they ever found who did it um which is frustrating and awful i don't even know if they're still doing anything for the cause anymore so no they didn't handle it well when the incident with the t-shirt happened everybody was making making that really political um and it was not political. It was like a racial slur that was used that is offensive to a group of people. And like, I've been called racial slurs before by many people. So I know how that feels. I know how it feels to be referred to as something that like, isn't your name or isn't something that you like identify to be like, my name is Sophia. And like, that's what I want people to call me, not some slur that has like a negative con connotation to it. Um, I think people were just making it really political when it didn't need to be. Um, it was just something that was seen as offensive and is offensive and people were turning it to, you know, like justify it or um, to make it seem like, you know, something that didn't mean as much as it did to, to the black community. Um, so I would say like sometimes things like don't need to be super political. Sometimes like it's about somebody's life that's being lost, like it's not about whether they were, you know, a leftist, like, drug dealer and um, a horrible, like, person. It's just, like, somebody died, and that doesn't need to be political. Same thing with the t-shirt. Like, it was a racial slur that was said, and it doesn't need to be turned into this, like, big political thing. It's just, it's okay to have empathy and to, like, listen to why people feel certain ways about things. It's okay if, like, your opinion isn't necessarily always inserted when it doesn't have to be, I'm speaking that like to like a broad, even to myself, like I do that sometimes, like I forget to listen to people and um, understand like, I may have my opinion, but you know, the way that they feel about something is also valid. Um, so yeah. I think yeah. As, the, as the school handles any racial incident, I think, I think they're doing an okay job and I think they need to do better. Um, like I said, I don't feel safe on campus, and uh, I think that's a problem, in my opinion. Um, if you had, if you put out a survey and the survey said one person felt unsafe, I think you should like you know speak to that person, find someone who would talk to that person, be like, hey, I got your survey. Um, what is it that we can do to make you feel better on campus? You know. And I think not just like on a, on like on a, um, a survey where like it's like anonymous because I feel like when we ever hear an anonymous survey, we're like okay, no one's gonna you know, but I feel like if you're comfortable with that and you're saying if you're comfortable saying you're unsafe, you know, say it so we can so you can get help. I'm I'm in that department as well. I'm getting help. Um, I have a counselor about it right now, and you know it's going pretty good. And I just. I just want to do the same for the next person because I don't want this. I don't want the next person to sulk in their room 
and feel like they're alone when they're surrounded with people who can help them out, you know? And I just want to help the next person. I think Gordon should um, do better with that and just understanding that people are still upset by this. Um, people are still angry by this. Um, I don't think that's going to go away until, like I said uh, before, uh, Gordon finds whoever will, finds out whoever day um, and like makes that public so we all are aware, like um, just like common courtesy. Uh, I think that also plays into account. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Good? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. All right. That's all I got for you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank Good. you, guys. This is super dope. Oh, <laughs>